welcome to tonight's installment of the 2023 Florida Oceanographic Coastal Lecture Series. For those of you who are joining us for your very first time tonight, my name is Zach Judd. I'm the Director of Education at Florida Oceanographic Society, and I am really excited to see another tremendous audience tonight. Uh, I have to tell you, last week we had our largest audience of the season so far. We had 160 here at the Blake Library and another 190 watching on Zoom. So 350 people came out to spend their Tuesday evening with us. And again, I couldn't be more grateful for the turnout that we've had lately. This is just a, a great testament to our speakers, and we wouldn't be able to do this lecture series without all of you. So whether you're here in person at the Blake or whether you're watching us on Zoom, I thank you. Tonight's guest speakers, Blair and Don Witherington, are professional naturalists with a strong focus on the marine and coastal realm. Blair is a research scientist with the Inwater Research Group, a marine conservation nonprofit. He holds a master's degree from the University of Central Florida and a PhD from the University of Florida. Dawn, who's in attendance tonight back at the book signing table, is a design, uh, I'm sorry, a graphic design artist and a scientific illustrator, and she was trained at the Art Institute of Colorado and Fort Lauderdale. Together, Blair and Dawn have merged their science their art, their writing, and their design into a wide range of products, including natural history books, posters, museum exhibits, including the Ocean Eco Center at the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Society, and a full line of sea-themed greeting cards. You guys do a lot. So tonight, Blair is going to be taking us on a tour of Florida's beaches. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Blair Witherington. Thank you. Thank you, Zach, for that very kind and generous uh, introduction. Uh, as he said, I'm Blair. Uh, I'm going to be doing the speaking. Uh, Dawn is in the back. She, important thing for you to know is that she made everything look pretty on the screen here. So she had a very important role to play. Uh, the title uh, of our talk is Florida Beach Quests, uh, and that means I'm going to take you on a journey. It's a journey similar to the one that Don and I have been on for the past 25 years or so. Uh, we love beaches. So who out there in the audience likes to spend time on beaches? All right, yeah, I see a lot of hands. So Don and I love beaches too. Uh, we kind of feel that every beach is wonderful. Every beach has something to offer, has stories to tell, and has amazing things to discover. We kind of feel that Visiting, visiting the beach is uh, like pizza. Uh, I mean, when it's good, it's great, and when it's bad, it's still pretty good. Uh, we've never been to a really bad beach. There are always things to, to find and discover on beaches. So the journey that Dawn and I have been on for the last 25 years or so include the last 15 or so years when we decided to put some of our journeys and the inspiration for those journeys uh, to others in print, and we've produced a number of books, including books on sea turtles and seashells and on beaches, including uh, a latest second edition update to our Florida's Living Beaches book up there in the top right, and uh, a brand new book out, just hot off the press, Beaches of the Gulf. So uh, this, each one of these endeavors allowed us to go on amazing adventures cataloging all the things that we find on beaches and then putting these things in print after learning about them. So these quests, so to speak, uh, really fueled these adventures that I'm talking about and the, uh, the journey that we'd like to take you on. And it's a journey that we think is especially important for anyone with curiosity, kids in particular, uh, kids at heart, which include most of you out there, I suspect, and of course, parents of kids. And uh, that journey is important for anyone to satisfy that curio curiosity within them. Uh, kids have a lot of curiosity that isn't always satisfied by the narrow screen of pixels in front of them that they're often glued to. So we really like to see more kids out in nature, as anyone who loves nature would like to see. And we thoroughly uh, uh, suggest that anyone who knows kids, who has kids, who has friends with kids, 
get those kids out, get them dirty and sandy and wet and experiencing nature out in the wild. Now, by the wild, you might be thinking, well, have my kids just run free uh, with all the savages and hazards out there in, in, in the open uh, wilderness? Well, yes, pretty much, uh, but it doesn't imply that all of your kids need to be running free on the African savanna. There are plenty of natural surroundings around us, and one of those really important natural surroundings that we have uh, right here near us is our beach. The beach is a very special place for kids and kids at heart to satisfy their curiosity and have adventures. Uh, the beach is a comfortable place. It's a safe place. You can run around in bare feet and pick up things, and most of those things are not going to sting you very much. Uh, so the important thing of, about a beach is that kids love beaches, and they love running wild on beaches, and they like to uh, express their curiosity uh, on those beaches. So why are beaches special? It's because beaches are very comfortable places, but it's a comfortable place where you can sink your toes in the sand, enjoy the breeze, and stand at the margin of the largest wilderness on our planet, the sea. And sitting at that margin or standing at that margin, you can examine what the sea brings forth. All sorts of amazing, beguiling, and astounding creatures from the sea, many of which are living close by, some of which are living far away, all delivered right at your feet there standing uh, in comfort on the beach. So beaches are amazing places that way uh, in terms of our uh, access to wilderness. But beaches are also really special because, and this is the theme of many of our books, that beaches are alive. And I mean alive in the literal sense, in that there are so many plants and animals that live above, uh, near, on, or even within the beach itself, like this lion sea star just waking up at dawn, low tide, and trying to, to crawl back to the, uh, to the sea. Uh, but in addition to being alive, literally, beaches are also alive in a metaphorical sense. Beaches wax and wane, they change with every tide, with every day, with every season, and between years. So beaches are extremely dynamic places that have superimposed cycles, many of which we know about, some of which we don't. And all of these cycles affect the living animals that are near, on, or within the beach. Uh, so with all of this life uh, and all of the cycles, it's almost as if the beach has a beating pulse. Uh, I, I really do feel strongly that beaches are living places that we can experience as such. Uh, and because beaches are so dynamic and amazing uh, and on the threshold of that big ocean wilderness that I was talking about, beaches are fantastic places to satisfy our curiosity and fulfill our quests. Now, I've used that word a few times, quests and it's the title of the talk. Uh, I should define it, I suppose. Of course, the dictionary definition of a quest is uh, the act of seeking. Uh, but we'd like to suggest uh, a definition that's a little bit more, oh, dramatic uh, and even romantic uh, than that. Uh, we're thinking about quests that are more like uh, the quest for the Holy Grail. Uh, these big things that you would really like to see and maybe never see, but still things that get you out and about and uh, enthusiastic about your journey. <clears throat> so in an example of what a quest might be, I'll point to metal detector guy here. He is on a quest. He looks like he's on a quest, doesn't he? So uh, his quest, I'm going to guess, is something like Spanish silver and gold. Uh, you know, they don't call this the Treasure Coast for nothing. Uh, people really do, uh, with a get up like this, find uh, Spanish coins of silver and gold that are historically important uh, and valuable. Uh, so it could be that that is his quest. What spurs him along? Now, chances are, over the years, he found some quarters, 
Uh, maybe someone's lost wedding band. Sure, interesting enough. But what does he find by the thousands in between? Probably just bottle caps. But he's on a quest. He's out in the fresh air. He is out in stunning scenery. And he has in mind that quest of someday finding that Spanish silver or gold. He's having fun. He is fulfilled. It's a good example of a quest. Uh, a good example because if that is your quest, to find Spanish silver or, silver or gold, you have a chance to do that. Uh, the 1715 Spanish fleet, uh, several ships that uh, wrecked on our shoreline, uh, contained not just these cob coins that you see here on the left, uh, but also gold and jewelry, jewels, uh, crosses, a, a lot of really valuable things that tell us a lot about the really rich Spanish folks that had their treasure shipped on those boats. Uh, and it's out there. So if, if you want to seek that as your quest, you have that as an opportunity. But some people might seek things that are just simply rare and beautiful, like this queen helmet shell. There are a lot of things that we really only see every once in a while that are amazing. And because of their rarity, we like to collect them. And those things might be on our quest. But there are a good many things that people might have for their quest that you can't put in your pocket and take home and put on your shelf of curiosities. These are moments when the light is just right and the breeze is blowing and you're feeling comfortable and you see something really beautiful like a female snowy plover sitting on her eggs very calmly and you're watching her at a distance with binoculars and having an emotional moment that you check into your own memory and save for a lifetime. It's not something that you could share with anyone else except for the stories you have to tell, but a quest nonetheless. And of course, there are those eccentric folks out there who enjoy collecting all kinds of crazy things. And believe us, there are a lot of crazy things out there on the beach. And all of them have amazing stories to tell. Uh, this on the left is Dawn with a big yacht fender. Uh, that she really enjoyed collecting on a beach cleanup. And here I am on the right with an old teak rudder uh, from a boat that wrecked during the Prohibition era when they were running rum from the Bahamas to Florida. So everything has a story to tell, and there are a lot of amazing things out there. So these quests are going to be what outlines the, the journey I'm going to take you on tonight. And uh, what I'll present is a suggested list of quests. Now, you might have a completely different idea of things that would be on your list of quests, but I'm going to make some suggestions. Uh, and as such, I will suggest, I'm not just going to leave you hanging. Uh, I'm going to give you a strategy uh, that you could follow to actually fulfill those quests. So for example, I'll give you some places where you're likely to fulfill that quest and find that thing. Uh, of course, the, the places that I'll mention aren't the only places where you can find these things. Uh, there are a lot of places around Florida where you could also uh, find things, but I'll suggest a hot spot for you. Season is also important. So it's not just where you go, it's when you go. Uh, and everyone knows the four seasons of Florida. Uh, there is snowbird season, there's pollen season, hurricane season, uh, tax season. No, Florida does have seasons. Uh, so all of those changes I was talking about before that take place on beaches with uh, wave amplitude and temperature uh, and wind conditions and sea state and the coming and going of sand and all of the animals and plants that are either blooming or seeding or not, these all have seasons. And so those seasons are important to follow if you want to find a particular thing that sticks to a season. Tidal cycle is also important. I won't talk about that a lot, but you should know that the tides are different between the Gulf and the Atlantic. We have two tides a day here on the Atlantic. Uh, we have mixed tides in the Keys in Southwest Florida and up in the Northern Gulf in the Panhandle of Florida, there's really just one uh, tide per day. Uh, and those tides vary with the lunar cycle where you have the biggest tides on a full moon and a new moon and smaller neap tides 
in the middle of those two moon phases. Uh, the area of the beach uh, where you expect to find these things, also very important. Uh, a lot of things that are uh, uh, buoyant or fluttery end up high on the beach. Uh, a lot of animals that live in the beach are best find at low tide, low on the beach. And there are a few things that are up in the dune. So all of these things are important to note. And of course, weather. So even in between all the cycles of uh, tides and seasons, there are weather events that punctuate really important opportunities to fulfill quests. One of the biggest opportunities, in quotes, uh, are tropical storms and hurricanes. When the w wind blows in, especially after it calms down afterward, these are very good times to find a whole host of things on the beach that suddenly show up uh, and you've never seen them before. <clears throat> so, I'll follow along with the seasons to, uh, to, to work our way through this list of quests, starting with springtime. Uh, we're kind of approaching Florida spring now. Uh, it's a little bit unusual for things to be this warm, but I've noticed that there are a lot of flowering plants, uh, a lot of birds passing through that you wouldn't normally see until it's a little bit later in the season. So this time of year up until about May is the, is the spring period that I'm talking about. And this is one of the amazing events of spring, the arrival of nesting leatherback sea turtles. How many people out there have had a chance to see a leatherback sea turtle, either nesting or, yeah, that's great. I bet a lot of you are offshore fishermen. Uh, offshore fishermen sometimes see leatherbacks out at sea. Uh, but when they come up onto our beaches, most often they nest at night, but especially in the spring, they on occasion haul themselves out in the middle of the day, as this nesting female did. Uh, the average size of a nesting female leatherback is about 800 pounds. They get as large as 2,000 pounds. They're the world's largest turtle, and they are spectacular. The suggested location for this quest uh, seeing a, a leatherback sea turtle nesting is MacArthur State Park. Now, leatherbacks nest in uh, St. Lucie County in good abundance, Martin, Palm Beach, uh, and to some extent in Broward County in, in good numbers so that in the spring, especially in May, which is the peak nesting month for leatherbacks, you've got a, a pretty good chance of seeing a nest. But if you want to actually see that rare event, of a leatherback on the beach nesting in daylight, you're going to have to put some time on the beach in places where there are a lot of leatherbacks nesting. And MacArthur State Park is a really good example, not just because it has a high density of leatherbacks. There's a leatherback in May, uh, through the month of May, probably a leatherback visiting that beach about every other night uh, or sometimes day. But leatherback is an, uh, uh, MacArthur State Park is an absolute jewel in Palm Beach County a beautiful example of maritime hammock uh, and undisturbed uh, beach. It's just a spectacular place to visit. Uh, and of course, the journey uh, is more important than the destination. So even if you don't see a leatherback, you'll enjoy your visit to MacArthur State Park. Beautiful, beautiful place. <clears throat> While you're there at MacArthur State Park, uh, whether or not you see a leatherback, look up on the upper dune for a little plant uh, called the burrowing four o'clock. Uh, it looks like this, and in the spring it will be flowering. Uh, it almost looks as if this plant should be in the dictionary under the definition of fuchsia. Uh, the the fuchsia-colored fla flowers are incredibly bright, especially when you see them in sunlight. It's a rare plant. It's an endangered plant. It's disappearing because the, the dunes where it grows are being replaced by uh, monocultures of sea oats or sometimes lawns or condominiums uh, and uh, it's disappearing unfortunately. This plant has a really special relationship with sea turtles. It, it loves to grow in the disturbed area that a sea turtle has made when it comes up to gather up sand with its flippers to cover its nest. So that turtle that goes up and scrapes away some of the dune plants is actually making an opportunity for this pioneering species called the burrowing four o'clock, a really astounding little beautiful flower. Uh, also in spring, sometimes we get a lot of wind blowing from the ocean. 
especially out of the northeast and the east. And those uh, winds off the ocean are bringing in a lot of things from the wide open sea that we don't normally get to observe. And one of the amazing animals out there in the wide open sea is this little tiny squid called spirula, or the ram's horn squid. Uh, the squid itself is pretty unimpressive. It's only about the size of a chapstick. But the buoyancy uh, uh, device that it has, uh, this curling ram's horn, uh, survives beyond the squid's life, floats at the surface, and then when the wind blows, it ends up on the beach. Now, the location I'll suggest for this is the Canaveral National Seashore, uh, in part because you might be the only person on the beach there. It's a beautiful, it's the longest stretch of undeveloped beach on the east coast of Florida. Uh, it's almost exactly as it was when the Spanish first uh, landed near uh, Cape Canaveral. And it's a great place to look right at the waterline for floating things from the open sea, like this spiral of the ram's, ram's horn squid. Uh, it's about the size of a nickel, uh, and it's exquisitely beautiful when you see it up close. Uh, one point of warning though, uh, it, a little ram's horn like this has probably survive, survived massive waves that bring it in out of the open sea. But if you put it in your pocket and forget about it, uh, be forewarned that it's not gonna survive the spin cycle of your washing machine. It will break into a zillion pieces. But if it survives getting home from the beach, you can put it on your shelf of curiosities and it will last for years and years and years. Uh, I already spoke a little bit about snowy plovers. Uh, they're beautiful little birds that look almost exactly like the sand that they sit on when they start to set up housekeeping right about this time of year. Uh, males and females will pair up in February and they'll be nesting on the beach, uh, bringing off chicks up until say July or maybe a little bit into August. If you watch them from a distance, you'll be able to see a lot of really interesting behavior and get a good look at this really beautiful bird. A great place to see them is one of uh, our favorite beaches, uh, Crooked Island uh, up in the Florida Panhandle. It's actually a, a military, uh, uh, part of a military reservation, but you can get out on the beach and walk along a very long stretch of beautiful, uh, pure white sand beach, except for a few shells uh, up in the upper beach, and see a lot of amazing things, including uh, snowy plovers. Now, a lot of people like to collect fossil shark teeth. Uh, and many of you who do know that the famous place to collect fossil shark teeth is Venice Beach in Sarasota County. It, it is in fact known as the shark tooth capital of the world, uh, but the abundance of shark's teeth sort of waxes and wanes. Uh, they'll have renourishment projects sometimes that cover up the shark's teeth but there's a constant supply of eroding 100,000-year-old uh, bay deposit that is constantly putting shark's teeth back up onto the beach. Uh, the place that I'll recommend, though, is a good bit south of there in Collier County, uh, which draws from a similar eroding bay deposit, uh, and that's Wiggins Pass State Park. Uh, it's a beautiful place to visit. Uh, you can collect a lot of other fossils in addition to shark's teeth. But if you're into catching, uh, collecting shark's teeth, you'll be able to find several different species from uh, great whites to tiger sharks to the so-called snaggletooth sharks or sand sharks, and maybe even the, the really big megalodon teeth. Don and I haven't found one yet, but if you're into shark's teeth, you're probably familiar with the big megalodon tooth that uh, has a tooth about as big as your hand. Uh, the actual shark was as big as a Chinese spy balloon, uh, they tell me. <laughs> big, big fish, lived a long time ago, and the teeth are amazing. <clears throat> also in the panhandle of, uh, sorry, also uh, on the Gulf Coast of Florida is Tiger Tail Beach, which is just to the north of Marco Island. It's a thin spit of sand shaped a little bit like a tiger tail that extends out from Marco Island and offers a really long walk uh, amongst really beautiful scenery. And some of that scenery includes, in the springtime, lease turns which are setting up housekeeping. 
Uh, and this is a photograph of a male lease tern uh, who is offering an anchovy, uh, minus the pizza, to his new bride, the, the female, right here. And if you walk along the beach, uh, you'll be able to watch these birds from a distance and see that behavior. There's a lot of really cool gift giving going on uh, between the male and female. And then they'll lay eggs and raise chicks and you'll get to enjoy that too. A great place to see uh, this bird behavior uh, among a really beautiful little bird, the least tern. Now a lot of you out there probably collect seashells. Yep, show of hands, who, who has a seashell collection? We just can't help but collect seashells, thanks. So uh, uh, those of you who do have a shell collection from Florida, uh, how many of you have co collected one of these, the Junonia? Yeah, I see just a few hands, not very many. And that's because this is a rare shell. So a rare shell worthy of a quest. Uh, it's beautiful, of course, but the thing that really attracts people most is that it's rare. You could visit the beach a thousand times and only find one of them. Uh, the story was that on Sanibel, uh, which the symbol of the island Sanibel is a Junonia shell. Sanibel is famous for Junonia. Uh, even there, the shell is rare enough so that uh, the, the story is that when someone finds one, they make the newspapers in Sanibel. Uh, of course, uh, you can go to a shell shop and you can buy one of these that uh, someone has dredged up from offshore, uh, but that's kind of like buying the wallet and keeping the photographs of the nice pretty people that are already in it. And it's, it's, it's not the same. It won't have a story connected to it the same way that your Junonia will. Uh, the Junonia on the right, uh, Dawn found while we were at this place, Cape Romano, which is where I suggest you go to find a Junonia. Now it's to the south of Marco Island. Uh, it's a, a beautiful little cape of land that's a wildlife refuge. You have to get there by boat, but it is shell heaven. Uh, in addition to being shell heaven, you can find uh, a, a Junonia there uh, if you look really hard. Dawn did a little dance when she found this one. And of course, we have a nice story to tell about it. Now we're into the summer season. And in summer, the, the ocean calms down. Uh, a lot of the turmoil of winter and spring with uh, heavy waves coming in off of the ocean has settled. And when the waves settle on many beaches, including uh, Stewart Beach and Jen Jensen Beach and farther to the north, you'll see these areas of shell hash forming where lots of different worn pieces of shell are all assembled by the ocean in one location. These are the places where you look for this quest item, and that is sea glass. A lot of people collect sea glass, and if you do, you know that there is a differing scale of rarity by the colors. Brown is pretty common, green a little bit less common, blue rare, uh, yellow and red, very rare. So if you look through enough of this shell hash and sea glass, you'll find some of those rare colors. And in fact, uh, a beach right nearby is one that I would suggest uh, you go to to fulfill the, your sea, sea glass quest. And that is North Hutchinson Island. Uh, it's a great place to find these big extensive uh, areas of shell hash. Uh, by the way, uh, one clue about finding anything in particular on the beach, and that is go to the areas where the sea has assembl assembled similar sized items and items of similar density. So if you're looking for something really tiny, look among tiny little shells. If you're looking for something bigger and more fluttery, look among the bigger and more fluttery shells. Uh, the ocean tends to sort out all the sediments on the beach that way. Other shells that I'm going to suggest adding to your quest list, including some that you might not think of right away as being spectacular, but they're rare, they're interesting, and they all have stories to tell. The lion's paw scallop and the imperial venus clam are often found on the beach at the Archicar National Wildlife Refuge up there in Brevard County and Northern Indian River County because these are really heavy, thick, robust shells uh, that they get carried in from offshore 
by the big waves at the Archie Carr Refuge, and they're tough enough to survive not being broken up by those waves. Uh, so it's a good place to find these shells. Below those shells are two more fragile shells, the Atlantic deer cowrie and the scaly scallop. Beautiful little shell, the shells, the scaly scallop uh, comes in a, a huge variety of colors from uh, uh, peach to orange to tangerine, uh, all different sorts of colors. So very collectible. And the reason why these somewhat fragile scallop shells and cowrie shells are found on the beach at the Archie Carr Refuge is that they are living right near the beach. They're living on the hard bottom reef that's just offshore in the surf zone. So they don't have to travel very far to reach the beach. And because they don't have to travel far, they don't endure all the hazards of wave wash and breakage that some of the other shells uh, have. So Archie Carr Refuge has a few key interesting shells. And while you're at the Archie Carr Refuge, you should know that you're on the beach that is the most densely visited by sea turtles in the United States. Uh, it's a 20-mile or so stretch of beach that receives an enormous number of loggerhead sea turtles uh, coming to, to nest and green turtles coming to nest. And this is a mating pair. This is Mr. and Mrs. Green Turtle. Uh, and they're right offshore in the Archie Carr Refuge. The reason why we see them in mating pairs so frequently off nesting beaches is because they choose to mate right off the surf. Loggerheads are mating out in deeper water uh, as they're traveling from the Caribbean or from the Gulf of Mexico in the Gulf Stream, and you're much less likely to see them. But green turtles are exhibitionists, and they linger at the surface for a long time. They're right outside the surf zone. You can stand on the beach and almost throw a shell. Uh, don't do that. They're a protected species. You don't want to throw a shell at them, but you could figuratively. So a lot of people ask about you know, what's going on? Why does it take so long for them to mate? And the answer is that the, the male is guarding his mate. So, you know, he've, he's mated with her uh, already, but he wants to make sure that a rival male uh, doesn't sneak in and also mate with his girlfriend. So he's going to hang on to her for hours and hours and hours and hours just to guard her. And that's what's going on. And so because they're lingering at the surface for such a long time, you get a pretty good Look at that, if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, also at the Archie Carr Refuge, uh, one of the very best places to see a sea turtle hatchling emergence. Now, as common as nesting is along the east coast of Florida, especially at the Archie Carr Refuge, you would think, well, there are hatchlings emerging all the time. And there are, but their peak emergence time is in the middle of the night. And it's dark in the middle of the night, and it's hard to see when it's dark. So they're getting from their nest up at the base of the dune to the ocean really quickly, and they're doing it at night, and you're unlikely to be able to see them. However, I've got a suggestion for you. Uh, Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge, the Brevard County stretch, probably the most densely nested stretch. Uh, your strategy would be to go out very first thing, uh, right before sunup, uh, or, out uh, near dusk, maybe just a little bit after the sun went down. So you're in the twilight period where there's enough light where you can see things pretty well and hatchlings will be emerging. So if you can remember this, go out at dawn when it was really dry and hot the day before. Uh, go out at dusk when it was rainy or cool that day. And the reason is it's temperature that prompts the hatchlings to emerge. And on a dry, hot day, it takes a lot longer for that sand to cool down. So it's going to be morning by the time a lot of the hatchlings are coming up and you have a much better time to see them. But especially with an afternoon rainstorm, that sand is cooling down really quick and you'll see some of these hatchlings emerging right near dusk. <clears throat> While you're there at the Archie Carr Refuge, especially the, uh, the, the southern part in Indian River County, uh, you can see little juvenile green turtles. They're uh, about uh, the size of a bread box or bigger. 
they're there on the nearshore reefs that are being colonized by uh, polychaete worms uh, and algae. And the green turtles are there to feed on the algae. And a lot of these reefs are right where the waves are breaking. In summertime, when it's calm, the water will clear up. And you, you can actually see these turtles swimming around. In addition to the southern end of the car refuge, uh, right here at Bathtub Beach or Blowing Rocks farther south, also good places to see little green turtles on the nearshore reefs uh, nibbling on algae. So one of the uh, quest items that Don and I had on our list was to see really spectacular dune scenery. And there's no dune scenery more spectacular than that in the panhandle of Florida, where the sands are completely 100% crystalline quartz, and all of that bright white quartz sand has been piled up by big tumultuous events into 50-foot high dunes crested with sea oats and, and other plants. Really spectacular scenery, and one of the best places to see this still is St. Joseph Peninsula State Park. A beautiful, beautiful state park. They were hit hard by Hurricane Michael. I think it was in 2018. Uh, uh, you can't camp there anymore, but you can still walk for miles and miles down the beach and see some of this really spectacular scenery. Now we're into the autumn of the year. Uh, it, it's not really cooling down very much, but a lot of the organisms that you might like to see are starting to adjust to uh, the, the coming winter and sea conditions. But also in autumn, uh, the wind begins to blow off the ocean again. Uh, and that wind starts to intercept some travelers from much farther south. And some of those travelers that uh, many people might have on their shelves and that collect and are on your quest list include sea beans. Now, I could talk forever about sea beans. Uh, we do sometimes. Don and I go to a sea bean symposium where a whole bunch of people meet. And you can imagine how crazily eccentric these people are, where they're, they're meeting for days and talking about sea beans. But it shows you how cool these things are. They're not just cool because they're beautiful. They're cool because they have amazing stories to tell. All of the species that I'm showing you here, uh, hamburger beans of genus Macuna, there are several species, sea purses, uh, the sea heart, or the Mary's bean, all of them grow far away in tropical rainforests. And the reason why we see them on our beaches, like the beaches of Jupiter Island, uh, which I'll suggest for this quest, the reason why we see them is because they float, uh, they've traveled down tropical rivers, eventually entered the sea, uh, traveled by currents through the, the, the Florida Straits, by the Florida Current, and when all the conditions are just right and the timing is critical, that wind uh, and current blows these beans out of the Florida current onto our beaches and at our feet. Uh, so they all have amazing stories, but they're beautiful. People polish them, make them into jewelry, and, and they're good luck. So what's better than that? <clears throat> also being blown out uh, of these currents, crazy eccentric things uh, that people collect sometimes, not to say that we're that type, but we do have a big uh, collection of what we call sea heroes. Now, these are children's toys that have made a sea voyage. And many of them have barnacles, and you can, they've got sun fading, and you can tell that they've been traveling for a really long time. And they're also things that you don't see sold in toy stores much around here anymore. They've probably fallen out of favor with sophisticated American kids. Uh, but in tropical America, uh, perhaps in the Caribbean, there are a lot of these things still being played with and perhaps lost or maybe set adrift on an adventure by a, by a child. So all kinds of crazy things from astronauts, cowboys and Indians, Batman, cheap knockoff Mickey Mouse, uh, lots of amazing things. And if you're looking for a really eccentric hobby, look no further than collecting sea heroes. Now I talked a little bit about the fall and the fall setting up a lot of things uh, that are preceding the, the windy and cold season of winter. One of the things that precedes the windy and cold season uh, is the migration of a lot of different fishes, including mullet. Uh, uh, this is the fall mullet run. 
for any of you who are fishermen, know that this is a famous time to get out and, and catch fish because there are a lot of predatory fish following these fingerling mullet. And I don't know if you can see right above the wave, the shadow in the back, that's a tarpon that's jumping up uh, amongst these mullet that are exploding like fireworks. So it's a, an amazing time to see the spectacle of nature. Uh, I mean, it, it's almost like sitting on that African savanna and watching lions hunt zebras, except you're on the beach in a nice comfortable place and you're watching tarp, tarpon hunting mullet. Uh, if you go in the afternoon when the sun is at your back here on the East Coast in a place like St. Lucie Inlet State Park, uh, you'll have a beautiful uh, scene to look at uh, and a nice uh, glow for all of these uh, amazing predatory events that are going on in front of you. Also at St. Lucie Inlet State Park, it's a great place to see another migration and that's the migration of this really impressive animal here. This is the, the great land crab, or the blue land crab, uh, Cardisoma. Uh, it's an uh, um, amazing animal uh, that is kind of the opposite of sea turtles in, term of their, in terms of their migration. Of course, sea turtles are migrating from far away to crawl up on land to lay their eggs. This crab lives in a burrow by the lagoon and when it's time for a female to lay her eggs, she's walking across land to go to the beach to lay her eggs in the ocean. So it's the exact opposite of sea turtles. Unfortunately, uh, this crab is not uh, on the protected list. It's not endangered. Uh, but I like to include it in the list of what should be endangered phenomena. Uh, time was there were tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of these crabs making the migration uh, from land to sea. Now we have just a shadow of that migration, but one of the places that you can experience it is St. Lucie Inlet State Park. Speaking of crabs, uh, these are stone crabs or crab stones. So not stone crabs in the sense of, you know, eating the claws. These are crabs that have gotten stoned. Uh, and it's a unique phenomenon, phenomenon that you can uh, experience in one place that I know of, probably in others, but uh, not that I know of. Uh, and that's the town of Satellite Beach on the east coast of Florida. Uh, there, there is uh, exposed Anastasia rock just offshore that contains these ghost crabs which uh, between as much as 100,000 years ago lived in burrows and were caught unaware by flooding events. And then uh, the freshwater pH was just right so that uh, coquina limestone formed around each of these crabs. And for some of them, you can see the one on the bottom, the, 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 the kela or the, the crab claw is exposed. Others, you can just barely see that there's a crab inside that stone. So when you go to Satellite Beach and you're looking for these crab stones, uh, don't pass up any sort of potato-shaped rock. Pick it up, take a look at it, and you might see a crab looking back at you. <clears throat> of course, beaches are, are nice places to enjoy beautiful scenery. Uh, one of the places to enjoy scenery uh, that is punctuated by a ragged, craggly uh, driftwood is this beach up in Northeast Florida called Black Rocks Beach uh, on Big Talbot Island. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful place, uh, nice and calm. It ha actually has a barrier island out in front of it. So the, the beach itself is relatively calm, but it's eroding to the point that the old oak and pine forest is now on the beach and offshore. And what you see are these really exquisite uh, twisted uh, oak trees uh, that set up really beautiful scenery and it, it, just a nice place to visit. Uh, if, it's, if that's on your quest list uh, to enjoy beautiful beach scenery, this is going to be one of those places you'll, you'll want to visit. Now easing into the winter uh, part of the year, uh, the wind is going to be blowing. Now I've spoken a lot about wind blowing off the sea and when the wind blows from the east here on the east coast, that's a great place to find some of these really strange blue water uh, animals that you would never see otherwise. Now the place I'm going to suggest to look for these animals in the Blue Fleet is uh, Cape Florida State Park 
uh, down to the south of us. But you can actually find these animals coming in any time the wind is blowing up and down the east coast of Florida. These are amazing animals. So these particular members of the blue feet fleet here, the blue button, the Portuguese man of war, and the by the wind sailor, uh, these are very distantly related to jellyfish. They're not jellyfish, they're actually hydroids. In fact, they're not just a hydroid animal. They are colonies of hydroids. So each one of these individual colonies is made up of many, many different animals that all uh, exist together in these floating uh, little colonies. So uh, the amazing thing about these, especially the Bailuin sailor and the Portuguese man-o-war, is that they depend on the wind to distribute them. They actually sail uh, to the point that there are right-handed versions of these animals that sail to the right, there are left-handed versions that sail to the left, and when you collect these, See if you uh, can see that all of the animals you collect are all left-handed or all right-handed because they typically sail together in a fleet and all the ones that are sailing the same direction end up on the beach at the same time. Along uh, with these other, with these uh, hydroid colonies that end up the, on the beach are some gastropods that are really cool that only live out in the wide open deep blue sea. Uh, one gastropod is this snail uh, the common purple sea snail, a beautiful purple colored snail, more purple on the bottom than it is uh, at the top, floats underneath a little raft of mucus bubbles, and that's its existence. Uh, also at the surface of the deep blue sea is this really cool sea slug. Uh, so they're related to snails, but they're snails without a shell. Uh, a sea slug called the blue glaucus, or sometimes called the blue sea dragon. Uh, now, don't be scared. They aren't that big. They're only about the size of a pea when you find them on the beach. Uh, but if you find a little blue pea on the beach, put it in a little seashell filled with water, and it will blossom out into its really beautiful form that you see here on the, the bottom right. So, really cool thing about these two animals, uh, the purple sea snail and the blue glaucus, they eat these guys. Uh, in fact, they eat the tentacles of these guys, uh, and it's even cooler than that. So these guys have stinging tentacles. In fact, Portuguese man of war, super famous for being toxic. If you're stung by that to a large degree, and especially if you're sensitive to it, it might send you to the hospital. So really uh, potent sting on the tentacles of these guys. But these guys eat the tentacles. And in an amazing way, uh, the blue glaucus uh, is notable because it can eat the tentacles off a of Portuguese man of war uh, and then swallow those nematocysts or stinging cells without having them fire, have that pass through its digestive system, and then sequester them in these hand-like organs on the side, which are called serrata. So it's almost like a big sea animal that makes a living eating the spear guns of divers uh, without setting off the spear guns and then storing it in the sea monster's body so that it can use it in its own defense later. And they will do that. I have a friend who saw a blue glaucus as he was surfing offshore and thought it was the coolest thing he ever saw. He picked it up in his hand and he was surfing. He didn't have any pockets, so he just popped it in his mouth. <laughs> Big mistake. Don't do that. <laughs> Uh, it, was, it, was, it was fire, and he had some bad words to say. So they really do collect the nematocysts of the Portuguese man of war and use them in their defense. Also in the wintertime, I don't know if any of you had a chance to see a, uh, a right whale named Pilgrim, uh, a female and her calf that went really far south this year. Uh, I think it went almost to Hutchinson Island and then went back. Uh, we got a chance to see it as it was passing uh, Wabasso in Indian River County. So winter is the time to see right whales, not quite this far south, but up in northeast Florida, uh, you'll have a better chance because their principal calving grounds are in the Georgia Bight, roughly uh, off of Cumberland Island, but including Jacksonville. But very frequently, they'll get down to Cape Canaveral and even farther south. I'll suggest Little Talbot Island as a place to see right whales. Uh, because it's near that calving ground. 
but also because it's a state park and state parks have very friendly rangers that you can talk to and they'll share with you any information they have on uh, right whales that happen to be passing through. So a really cool thing to see because the females actually pass very close to the beach, like in the surf zone. They're big animals and their bellies are scraping the sand as they're uh, going south and north in, in shallow water. In the winter, uh, we, I mentioned it was snowbird season. Uh, we have a lot of actual, literal snowbirds that come down, uh, some of which we have here all year round, but we have greater numbers in the winter, like the black skimmer, uh, and other birds that we don't see any other time but winter, like Bonaparte's gull. And these are both birds that you can see and enjoy from the beach uh, because they're just so very conspicuous. And the place I would suggest for this birding uh, is Sanibel Island. Famous for shells, but also a fantastic birding place on Sanibel Island is the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. Also on Sanibel, a whole bunch of people that are not paying any attention to birds and are bending over looking for shells. Uh, and the birds know this and they're just friendlier there. Uh, so if you're standing quietly, you can watch a little Bonaparte's gull ducking around in the surf, uh, catching fish or skimmers doing what their name suggests, um, uh, feeding in the surf, and it, it's just a beautiful place to observe birds. Also, of course, on Sanibel, seashells. Uh, there are a lot of seashells that people enjoy collecting. Here are some relatively uh, uncommon ones that might not be on everyone's quest list, but I think they're beautiful. The Sunrise Talon, uh, you can see how it was named, a beautiful, beautiful red and yellow, uh, bivalve, and then little shells like these wintel traps, the angulate and the brown banded wintel trap. These are exquisitely beautiful shells, but they're only about an inch long or smaller. And a lot of people ask us, you know, where do I go on Sanibel Island to find shells? And the answer is, of course, any, anywhere. Uh, when do I go to collect shells? And the answer is, you know, any time you get a chance. Uh, but there are some hot spots. Of course, low tide is important for shelling. Uh, that allows you to walk on more exposed sea bottom and collect more shells. Also, the secret place for shells, especially these little tiny gastropods like wintel traps, is the very southern tip of Sanibel Island Lighthouse Point. It's a place where you can just sit uh, and go through piles of shells and zen out and look for these little tiny beautiful shells along with other beautiful species that you can find there right at Lighthouse Point. So there you go. Be sure to not tell anybody, that's a secret spot. <laughs> uh, so we're at the end of our journey now. Uh, hopefully uh, I've, I've offered at least some suggestions for your quest list. Uh, I'll leave you with just a few quotes. Uh, one is from Leonardo da Vinci, who I think is the person we can attribute this quote to. And of course he's right, everything is connected to everything else. Uh, here you see the egg case from uh, the largest gastropod in Florida, the Florida horse conch, uh, connected to the largest cockle in Florida, and, and that's the, the, uh, the heart cockle or the Atlantic cockle. And then growing on that are barnacles and oysters, and of course connected to that is my lovely and talented wife Dawn. And the point is that everything is connected to everything else, including to us. We have really important connections to nature that we can find on a beach. Uh, and another quick quote to offer you, and that is that it's, it's way better uh, to have a taste for collecting uh, those things that others pass by uh, than to, to have a whole collection of Rolls Royces in your garage. Uh, so I'll leave you with that. And I'll take your questions, and thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the question is about the hurricane on Sanibel. Uh, they, they took a bad hit. I'm sure you saw a lot of the news stories uh, from the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. Uh, the Shell Museum uh, did sort of okay. The, the, the most important part of any museum is the collection. Uh, of course, the building was damaged, but the collection uh, was okay. 
So uh, that, that's the most important thing. I'm not sure if they're open yet. Uh, does anyone happen to know if the Bailey Matthews Museum is open yet? Uh, I know we were to give a talk there, uh, but had to cancel uh, because it, it, the hurricane was absolutely just devastating. Uh, but the glass is half full. Uh, we're getting reports from Southwest Florida, like on a daily basis, people are finding Junonia shells. And it's because of the hurricane. Uh, it really churned things up. So not just on Sanibel, but there north and south, uh, that hurricane really churned things up. And there are a lot of amazing things coming ashore. But people on Sanibel have a, a long road to, to build back. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so the question is about some, some human remains that were found on the beach that are from the, the native people. Uh, uh, not to get too long a story, but I'm familiar with uh, some bones that were found up at Sebastian Inlet State Park in what was a, a, a burial site uh, that wasn't eroded from the beach, but it was very close by. So up there were the Ais people uh, who lived as far south as uh, probably Hutchinson Island. Uh, they, they didn't live on the island. It, you can imagine being on the island in summertime with all the mosquitoes that were here preceding uh, the mosquito impoundments. It was pretty brutal and the, the native people weren't crazy. Uh, they were on the barrier island in the winter, but they would migrate back to the mainland uh, during the summer. Uh, there were a whole series of people who lived along the coast uh, almost none of which are represented in our human population now. Unfortunately, they, they all went away. The, the Seminoles and the Miccosukee that we're familiar with were, were Creek people that came down from Oklahoma uh, and, and now are the Native uh, Americans here in Florida. Uh, but those people represented by the bones you're talking about uh, may not be represented in the human population at all anymore, which is, which is pretty tragic, but uh, kind of an amazing thing to, to think about in terms of what life was like for those people in Florida all those many years ago. Yes, ma'am. Aha, uh -huh, great question. So uh, the question is about the sea beans. Can we plant them and can they grow? Uh, long story, sometimes they'll grow. Sometimes you'll see them if it's a really rainy summer they'll soak up water on the beach and they'll actually sprout. But they're tropical plants and they can't take any cold weather at all. So even down into the 50s will kill them. Are they but uh, They're vines. So most of them are woody vines. Uh, those that I showed you, the uh, hamburger beans, the sea hearts, uh, the uh, sea purses, uh, those are all woody vines that grow up in the canopy of the tropical rainforest. And just a really quick story, I have a friend who collects sea beans and is actually a world expert on sea beans. Uh, he was very interested in doing just what you suggested, and that is planting these seeds and seeing if they will grow. And uh, he did, and on occasion would have success. And boy, talk about Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, he had some examples of this thing just going crazy and out of control and growing up the trees in his yard. But like I said, they don't make it through a normal winter and they die, which is why we don't have them here in Florida, growing as a plant and flowering, producing seeds. Can I do one more comment? Yes. I have Yeah. Uh, so the, the comment is about life on Sanibel now. Thing, things are just barely coming back with, with uh, not much electricity. We have, a, we have a question from one of our Zoom attendees. Uh, they're wondering, how is it possible that there's only one tide per day in the Florida Panhandle? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try not to make this a long story. <clears throat> so uh, probably a lot of you know about how tides are influenced by the sun and the moon. Uh, it's the sun and the moon uh, and the turning of the planet that gives us tides on the Atlantic coast. And those pulls and tugs 
of gravity from the moon, uh, the moon and the sun drive two tides a day on the Atlantic. But in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the tides are really different. Tides in the, the Gulf of Mexico are almost like a drum pulsating with a high in the middle of the Gulf and a low in the middle of the Gulf. Uh, so that when it's low in the middle of the Gulf, it's high on the perimeter. And when it's uh, high uh, in the middle of the Gulf, it's low on the perimeter. And what that means is that those Gulf tides are more and more independent of the Atlantic tides. It also means that high tide in, say, Pensacola is the same time as high tide uh, at the southern tip of Texas. Oops. Uh, so tides are crazy things, and it gets way more complicated from there. Yes. We'll take another one from our online audience. How do you think climate change will alter the dispersion of many of the organisms that you talked about tonight? Uh, profoundly. So uh, I, I spoke a lot about seasons and temperature tolerances, the wind blowing, uh, catastrophic events like storms and hurricanes. Uh, by the way, these catastrophes are also opportunity events for a lot of organisms. But uh, a good many of the organisms I talked about are adapted to predictable cycles, like hurricane season starts about now and ends about then. Uh, I can bank on the temperature in the wintertime being in this range. Uh, when that starts to become less predictable, and changing, we start to see changes in the distribution of animals when they express behaviors. Sometimes they can't adapt if all of that climate happens very quickly uh, and they get into trouble in terms of uh, lowering population numbers or they'll shift, they'll change in their distribution. Uh, one of the most profound effects we see from climate change is the distribution of animals that used to be only in the south creeping farther and farther and farther north. Uh, so, who knows, one of these days those sea beans that don't stand any ch chance of sprouting here in Florida are going to take over the state. <laughs> any other questions from our audience at the Blake tonight? All right, I think that's a great time to wrap up. Can we get another big round of applause for Blair and Dawn? Thank you very much. So, I do want to remind you we have a couple of minutes left in our book sale and book signing. If you haven't thumbed through one of their books, please go take a look. Absolutely incredible photography, fantastic writing, great storytelling. I think each and every one of you will find something on that back table that will, will inspire you, you know, in the evenings as you're falling asleep, reading yourselves to bed. It's, they're really captivating books. I do want to remind you one week from tonight, we have Dr. Lorraine Simpson, Director of Scientific Research and Conservation from FOS, and uh, she's going to fill you in on all the incredibly important work that she and her team are doing right now to try to fix our local waterways with a focus on seagrass. So I hope to see all of you here one week from tonight. Good night, everyone.